Well, howdy. My name is Justin Tyone, and I am a hotelier. I am the department head for hospitality and tourism management host at Highline College. I'm also a global board member for HFTP, that's Hospitality, Financial, and Technology Professionals, as well as the chair of High Tech San Antonio, which was supposed to be occurring in June. Um, we have now pushed that back to the end of October, and it's due to COVID-19. But what in our industry isn't right now? I mean, even the scruff on my face is uh, due to COVID-19. So we're working from home, and as a um, hotel industry in the hospitality in general, we are just, we're getting hurt out there. And I wanted to make this little video, kind of give people an update on what's going on industry-wide. I'm lucky to be on some think tanks, I'm just trying to serve the industry well, uh, and I'm also staying abreast of STR, CBRE, and uh, HFTP knowledge bases. So I first wanted to give thanks to these organizations that are assisting me in putting together today's little lecture here. So that would be HFTP, um, CBRE, and STR. STR is a fantastic data organization for the lodging industry based in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And they even have something called the Certified Hospitality Industry Analytics, the CHIA. Uh, you can earn that. It's a short-term certificate. So while we're working from home, perhaps that's something that you'd be interested in. CBRE brings data to the industry. They're a fantastic partner for all of the lodging industry, from feasibility studies and branding to just generally what's going on. And then HFTP is a professional association that serves their mission of education and serving their members who are financial and technology professionals industry-wide. And of course, there in the top right is uh, my who I work for, my employer, Highline College in Seattle, Washington. So today I'm going to take you through some basics of the staffing levels and what's going on in our industry. I'm going to show you some markets. We're going to look at the United States. We're going to look at some specific cities. We're going to look at some clientele types that are not helping our lodging industry problem and uh, long term. What's going on with these clients and when are they going to come back and stay at our properties? Uh, and then finally, the most important question is, what does the future of the hospitality industry, of the lodging industry, look like here in the United States? So let's kind of start here with some staffing levels. Basically, what you're going to see is across the board, none of these are good. We're dealing with full service staffing levels being down 72%. Select service properties, uh, those are the ones that don't really have food and beverage offerings. Um, you're looking at being down 66%. Now, out of this, there are you could even look at a little further, which is urban hotels are even hit harder, and resort hotels are being hit the hardest. Resort hotels are down 90% in staffing levels. Um, our urban properties are sitting between 4 and 9, 10% right now in cities like Washington, D.C., Seattle, New York, New Orleans. Um, th this is all disastrous numbers, obviously for our industry and it's hurting all of our team members, the people we work with every day. Even those who have not been laid off, you can see from charts like this, maybe they haven't been laid off, but they're having their hours cut. If you're used to working 40 hours a week and now you're working eight hours a week, uh, that's obviously going to hurt you quite badly. So when did these layoffs really begin? Um, they didn't really start uh, until early March, but even in early March, they were few and far between, and they really took off in mid-March. And that's where we realized as an industry that this was going to hit us hard. It was going to be long-term. And we lost something like 72% of our employees total have lost hours. Um, and 17% of hoteliers in the United States have been laid off completely. Not just told, don't come back to work for the next four weeks or something. They've just said, we don't have a position for you permanently, and we're laying you off entirely. So when you're losing almost 6%, uh, 5.4% of your staff of the entire nationwide structure of hotels, and they had lost, um, we had lost more than 6% simply in the um, one week previous. So really we lost 12% over two weeks and then it turned into 17% over a slightly long period of time. Um, I mean, we're talking three, four weeks here total, 17%. So hospitality is being impacted the most. Social distancing and hospitality 
um, do not go together very well. It's it's hard. You can't travel. You can't eat out. So that sort of thing. And the ones that are individuals who are choosing to travel, the resorts, those are the ones that are really going to be hit the hardest. And urban properties where you've got business settings, these are going to be hit the second hardest. Um, because our business clientele, they're not traveling. Um, also, weddings and events, those sorts of things are not occurring. What is occurring, and this is affecting in a positive way, the value-based properties. You're looking at the economy or the mid-scale properties. Are You're getting... Um, Healthcare workers, you're getting people who need to visit areas that are outside of their normal zone. Um, in Wuhan, China, just as an example, um, Wuhan had the highest occupancy rate in the entire world last week. Their hotels were at uh, slightly over 70%. But the reason for that is because of all the healthcare workers, all of the individuals who had to enter Wuhan for government business, uh, and travelers who got stuck in Wuhan. And so they ended up with higher rates. Well, we obviously don't want to have a lockdown in the United States, um, but there are things that hoteliers in the United States can learn from that, which is that there are emergency support personnel like healthcare workers, um, police, um, firemen that can all pull on this. Um, I know when I was working in a hotel in Houston, I managed a property for Hilton. And what we did during the hurricane was we turned our entire lobby into an emergency personnel area, and that did help our occupancy. So resort hotels are showing this 90% decline. This is where it's getting hurt hurt the most. These are your travelers who are um, FITs, frequent independent travelers who are not in, in the business side of things. Our current staffing levels are at 9.3. Normally we'd be at 87.8. Um, that is obviously just, just killer. And there's no way around something like that. I mean, emergency personnel or trying to turn it into uh, hospital hospital workers and firemen and police departments or travelers who are stuck in a location. Resorts can't really rely on that the same way if it's been cut this drastically. This is just another chart to show that your urban and your resort properties are showing the lowest occupancy levels. This is a good point, place to also say that hotels don't only exist for guests to stay at. They're real estate assets. And so when we're looking at them as a real estate asset and we're looking at our return on investment, um, we're really trying to break out on our pro forma. Seven years usually is more of what we're looking at. So unlike a, uh, a restaurant, hotels are not looking to break even immediately or turn a profit on a daily basis. We do purchase them as longer term assets and we are paying attention to things like cap rates and the other real estate terminology. Uh, and so what you're going to be looking at here are, even though the urban and resort properties are going to hit very hard, we also need to think about what's our industry going to look like two years out, three years out, because we're not, we can't just close our doors. We own these facilities and they are real estate assets. So interstate properties, airport properties, small metro properties, these are down at 20% in the United States. Another thing that I would really warn us about is we originally we're thinking in most locations, and certainly this happened in South Korea, it happened in Wuhan, China, um, China as a whole, we thought it would be like a V. So occupancy comes down and then goes straight back up, but it's not. It's turning into more of a U shape. And this is because of the lack of lockdown in the United States, and this is a lack of really quarantining and social distancing effectively, maybe a a sense of we don't really know what necessarily what we're supposed to be doing as a population, as a society. So it's turned into more of a U shape and it's gonna take a lot longer for it to come back, even though we're hitting that bottom. And that's just where effective planning and leadership can help us a lot. Um, and this is where we're gonna learn things now that we'll be able to implement in the future. So as we look at city by city, um, and we're moving in that direction, I wanted to show, um, so we're going to break it down to city, but we're going to start at the very top, the nationwide. And this is some other things that um, really affected us in the last little while in a similar way, maybe, um, to what we're going through now. So the great financial crisis that originated in the New York market, you can see how it was just straight down um, immediately and then slowly worked its way up. SARS, New York, kind of the same thing, the tech bubble. Um, it's really good to look at historical data to see how that's going to affect us in the future. Um, I was in Toronto um, shortly after SARS, and I remember that really, really well and how it hit the city. And we were down at 
lot of our, our best properties were down at five and 10% and thinking about closing. But you can see how far, how, how clo uh, quickly it came back. You were looking at seven months um, and it was back to normal. We are not going to see that here with the way that um, COVID-19 has done. It's going to take us with the U-shape that we've created through um, some poor outlines of how this is going to be, how it's done and our approach to it and that this was worldwide. It's going to take 16 months is what I'm hearing from most of the projections, what I'm seeing the projections. So here in the United States, um, this chart, once again, it's just a disastrous to look through. It's not funny. I just, you, it's so bad you can't help but just smile and laugh and what are you going to do about it? Um, in 2020, we're looking at being down a total in RevPAR. That's revenue per available room. That's the most important metric for a hotelier. Uh, we're down 57.2%. And uh, yeah, sure, you can look at 2021 and say, hey, we're going to come back 72.7%. .7%, but you're not looking at getting back to normal until early 2022. You're just, you're just not. It, it, 16 months is kind of what I'm looking at. And uh, maybe you get back in late 2021 then, but I'm I'm not really seeing us really get back until maybe even early 2022. So uh, the good news, all right, good news, there is some. Here we go. It's that U.S. occupancy levels are truly stabilizing. We've hit our rock bottom. We do not think we are in the U shape at the bottom, and now it's just going to stay at the bottom for a while because it's not going straight back up. But we are stabilized. We're now going to sit here at 21.6% uh, nationwide. 21, maybe hits 20, but you know, we're going to stabilize now. It's not like we're looking to go down to 10% like uh, originally we may have thought. Now, the bad news out of this is when you're looking at the entire nationwide, our rooms, it's the resorts and the luxury properties that are in urban areas that get hit, hard, hit the hardest. And those are the ones that have the highest rev par. Those are the ones where it costs the most to stay at that. It's it's our highest end properties. So while this looks like good news that it's stabilized, it's stabilized at worse than 21.6% legitimately. And that's because of RevPAR. And so here's what we're really looking at with RevPAR. Uh, I have broken down by city here. Um, you can see the cities that really got hit the hardest. There's kind of big drop off there. It's Washington, D.C., Seattle, Chicago, Honolulu slash the entire island of Oahu, uh, San Francisco, Boston, and New York City. And they're kind of all by themselves having really has, had a destruction of all this. The reason that New Orleans is almost there, but not quite, is that Mardi Gras, they did not shut it down. The hotels were still getting quite a few consumers. We know how that turned out. That was a bad idea. But New Orleans technically had that market. And so that kind of helped New Orleans a little bit because they have extensive shoulder seasons. And then as you go through, none of these cities are doing well. But you can see as we get to less metro areas, uh, maybe the mid-markets, Columbia, Albany, Richmond, Raleigh-Durham, Memphis, Cincinnati, Albuquerque, those sorts of cities that are mid-markets aren't being hit quite as hard. Yes, they're down 42 43%, but uh, they're not dying. So as we continue looking city by city, it should also be pointed out that certain locations earn almost all of their money or, or a majority of their money in the spring. So for example, Phoenix does approximately 45% of their business in the spring. That is a huge number. People go to Phoenix in the summer. It's, it's almost 50% of their money. So Phoenix is going to get hit, even though their percentages are down less, they're going to get hit really, really, really hard. Now, that's the opposite of, say, Honolulu, Seattle, Albany, Long Island, um, where these cities actually do worse in the spring than any other time of the year. So as you're looking at this, you say, well, Albany is only down 42 percent and normally they don't even do well in the spring. Maybe Albany, of all cities in the United States, is doing the best overall. If you're in the Albany market, congratulations. You're a disaster, but not as bad a disaster as the rest of the hotel market. So as we look international at our international clientele, our market, it's only 8% of the market in the United States comes from abroad, but they spend on average almost triple the amount. And so that's also money that enters our economy. So the multiplier effect is really high, if you know what that is from economics. 
But I'd also point out that um, tourism is an export, but it's the only export where the business comes to us. And it's an export because we don't leave, but the tourists come to us and spend money with us. Any other export is us sending a product abroad and then then the abroad or organization, local company, country, they send us money. That's part of what makes tourism so cool as an asset for us. And that's why the international is so important as a market. It's much more important than 8%. It's going to make up more than 20% of our money because its occupancy is 8%, but 20% of our money. But when you include how much more they pay in all the other areas to get here, um, in what they spend in restaurants and what they spend on food and shopping and all of that, it's going to constitute something like 25 to 30% of our money. So um, big, big important thing. You can see Miami is going to get hit really hard there. So with Honolulu, New York, San Francisco, Orlando, LA, Boston. These are the locations where internationally people are choosing to go. So what does the future look like? Because this is really what's the most important, perhaps, um, part of all of this is, is we want staffing to pick back up. And staffing, even when it comes back, it's going to, first, um, people who are general managers are going to be hired as front office managers. People who are front office managers will become front desk agents. Uh, people who were you know, outlet managers will be servers. That's who's going to first get the jobs. And the emerging people, those graduating from school, um, are going to be in a, a little bit worse off position at the beginning. So networking and who you're able to rely on and being the best of the best is going to be that much more important. Here it really shows what the U looks like. China came back so fast because they did such a great job with the lockdown. Um, Italy is not going to come back in quite the same way. Um, they locked down over a shorter period of time for different areas and it, it didn't work out quite as well. But the United States is going to have a U shape and that's going to hurt us compared to China very badly. Whereas you can see China getting back only after 10 months or so, you're really looking at the United States not getting back for another 16 months from now. So whatever that is, that's summer 2021. And honestly, um, for the workers and the employees, um, we could learn a lot about efficiencies. We could learn about staffing, not getting back to the levels. This is the staffing levels, not getting back until 2022, quarter one. Um, there you go. It's not a pretty picture for us here in the lodging industry, but I hope that I was able to give you some interesting data that you can um, understand the industry and what's going on a little bit better. Thanks for watching.